Hello, my name is Tim Shoebridge. Welcome to this video. I am almost at the end of recording a review of the Behringer System 55 range of modules. I've actually been working on that video for literally months. I mean, not every day. That would be rather silly, wouldn't it? But I have been working on it for months, uh, getting familiar with the modules, writing some music, investigating certain things. It's taken me a long time. And what I realized is I've got so much material because there's so much to talk about and let's face it there's so many modules uh, I'm finding it difficult to squeeze it into a, sort of like an hour long review video so um, I've decided to sort of like pick some little bits out and put them in little isolated videos sort of like little talking points little investigations about these modules and this is the first of those um, the title is demystifying the clamping point uh, it's rather weird isn't it? it involves this module here it's a 921 oscillator module. Now when you start getting into the, the System 55 range you'll realize that you've got quite a lot of choice. There's a, there's, a, there's a couple of different choices in terms of oscillators. This is just one of them. Um, there are pros and cons with what you choose. You'll also find that there are some rather weird sort of terminology going on here with these things and I know it's sort of all steeped in history. You know this was Bob Mo creating these uh, these modules starting actually in the 60s and then into the 70s and he clearly is an engineer he's not a musician so there's some interesting terminology you will come across when you start looking at these modules the terminology on this one that got me really quite baffled was something called clamping point now there's a there's a little uh, potentiometer here called clamping point I'll put a, a close-up of it on the screen for you and I thought what the hell is clamping point so um, I did an internet search and I have to say I didn't really get a very satisfactory answer so I've decided to do my own investigations employ the services of an oscilloscope which you can see behind me here uh, it's all been rather exciting uh, that is what is going to be in this video um, it's just a very very brief video it's going to demystify what this clamping point is and this sort of triggering that you can do with this oscillator um, actually now I know um, and now I've sort of like tried it out for myself I really love this oscillator I have to say uh, it's very very useful so if you are into making bass sounds or or really snappy lead sounds this module might well be the module that you're looking for so please watch on if you're interested it's only a short video um, talking about clamping points and what the hell that is uh, until the next one as always thank you very very much for watching Right, so the key to using this clamping point functionality on the oscillator is to trigger this oscillator module every time you hold down a note or your sequencer plays a note, just the same way that you would trigger an envelope generator, for example. Um, now, there are two CV inputs on the front panel of this oscillator for us to use to trigger it. These are them here. One is labeled V and one is labeled S. Now, to be honest with you, this whole V trigger and S trigger is a subject in its own right, which deserves its own video. Um, so that's what I'll end up doing. Uh, just Let's just say for the time being that V trigger, that V trigger input is a normal Eurorack gate or trigger input uh, that you can take from your keyboard, from a MIDI to CV converter, from a sequencer or whatever else you have. So that's how we're going to be triggering the 921 modules. Um, and what I'm going to do is just trigger one module on its own, show you the waveform on my oscilloscope and show you the effect of triggering it, basically resetting this oscillator by triggering it. So I'm just going to trigger the oscillator module by just pressing down on a key and this is what we see on the oscilloscope. You'll see there that the waveform has been interrupted at the exact point where I triggered uh, the oscillator module. Um, now the point at which the, the waveform then continues after it's been interrupted is based on your clamping point. At the moment, my clamping point is set midway, which is why uh, the waveform starts again at zero, basically in the middle. If you think about the clamping point as being on the y-axis, uh, you'll see that we have, when the clamping point is at maximum, it's at the very top, minimum it's at the very bottom, and midway round on that dial is at zero. So that's why the waveform has restarted after triggering at zero. 
So let's have a quick look at what the clamping point does uh, on the oscilloscope. Let's start by turning the clamping point up really high and have another go. And here you can see the waveform has been interrupted and it jumps directly to that clamping point, which is way up high. And now another go. Let's turn the clamping point right down and see what that looks like. And there, as you can see, the clamping point is now low, almost down at the bottom, and the waveform jumps right down to it. So now let's have a go at triggering two oscillators at exactly the same time, because to be honest with you, that's kind of the use case. That is the real use of this re-triggering functionality and this clamping point functionality, is having multiple oscillators uh, being triggered at exactly the same time. Um, you'll see here that the two oscillators are at fairly different frequencies. They're not tuned at all. Uh, one is much uh, faster than the other one. But let's see what happens when we re-trigger them both at the same time. So the clamping point for both of these oscillators is midway around the sort of zero mark. And you'll see that in terms of the yellow waveform, it gets pulled down to midway. Uh, it's on its upward sort of phase at that point. It gets pulled down to midway. And the blue waveform is on its downward phase right towards the bottom. It gets pulled up to midway. And you'll see that from that trigger point onwards, uh, both of those waveforms have, have started a new phase. They're at different frequencies, but they have started a new phase. Okay, so let's put our theory to the test. Let's listen to some real audio examples. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play two oscillators together. Those oscillators I've tuned as closely together as I can, but they won't be exactly in tune. I'm going to first off, without triggering them, just play a single note over and over again, and let's hear if we can hear any variation in the timbre of those notes. Then I'm going to implement those trigger CVs and let's hear what the difference is. So let's start off, first of all, without any triggering. This is just like normal oscillator operation. And now, by contrast, let's trigger these oscillators together exactly at the same time and hear the difference. So you can hear there, there is a variation. There's a definite variation in sound from one note to the next without triggering. But when we trigger, the sound is exactly the same, consistent and repeatable every single time. Let's try it with a bass note this time. So first of all, no triggering, just regular playing of these two oscillators together, playing bass notes. Definite variation there. Now let's try it with the trigger. Again, clearly very, very consistent sound, the same sound, exact same sound every single time. Now, normally you use multiple oscillators together to add some fatness to your sound. And if you've got the oscillators really tuned closely together and you use this trigger method, uh, then you're not getting that fatness. So let's see what happens if we slightly detune the oscillators just a little bit and then do the test again. First, play a note without any triggering and then play it with.
So that is without any triggering, and you can hear definite variation from one note to the next. It's really quite pronounced. Now let's try it with triggering. And there, hopefully, you can hear that we have got the benefit of detune, but we've got a very predictable and repeatable sound. I think that this is the same technology uh, that Bob Moog had in his 91 modules that he then went on to put into the Taurus bass pedals. So the final piece of the puzzle is, what does the clamping point do to the character of the sound? I'm going to leave the clamping point on one of the oscillators alone, and on the first oscillator I'm going to sweep that clamping point, and let's hear what difference it makes. <laughs> So there's a lot of variation there from really quite soft through to hard and clicky, but it's consistent with every note and that's what's most important. So that's it for this video really. If you really want some nice snappy basses and leads or just consistent results from one note to the next, then this is a really good module for that kind of thing. There's a lot there to experiment with yourself, uh, different waveforms, different clamping point offsets, uh, different detune amounts. Uh, there's an awful lot there to play around with. Uh, it's a great module.